I was a school student and then I did one year of veterinary science before I uh, joined up. And I joined up on the 18th of December 41, so it was only uh, 10 days after Pearl Harbor. I was trying to enlist before, but I wanted to go in the Air Force and all, you know, fight the banging bomb bombs. And <laughs> no, no such luck. I, I was coloured effective, you see, so I didn't do that. But it was so close to the Japanese declaration of war, they were up for anything, and they sent me on a, uh, an armed guard for uh, Richmond Aerodrome in Sydney, about four days after. <laughs> Me up. But I've been a cadet, you see. Oh, well, I went to Cowra and Dubbo and then went to Bathurst. We went up to New Guinea and we're in general reinforcements in the pool there for well, about a month. And then we got sent to the 2nd 14th Battalion on the 16th of December, 42. And it was most fortunate, I suppose, from my, from my point of view, because I met all the, missed all the nasties. You know, like being a gunner. Oh, go, uh, Kakoda, being a gunner, they all, what was left of the battalion went through that. The 39th and the Papuan Infantry Battalion were the first one to Kakoda. And our battalion got up to Isharava just in time to relieve them, said, You can go home. They said, Like hell, we know what's going on. And they had lost 130 odd men killed then at that stage, but they wouldn't go. They were terrific, those blokes, they really were. And they got so abominably treated because they just wiped the battalion after all. They just scrubbed it. There wasn't any 39th battalion. Then, then when we came back in 43, about the middle of 43, we flew up and uh, landed at Madzab. And then our battalion went off on a, on a separate thing to try and catch the nips coming down from there. We marched up there for two days, and I remember seeing about 200 natives in full regalia. They, they kept the well away from us, and we're still within range of the 25 short pounders, so we marched for two days, and they're still about 10 miles in distance. That's how rugged it was. I can remember we had a bit of a, a stouse there, but I saw some sort of Papuan infantry blokes, they were incredible, because they're down the ground smelling the Japs like puppy dogs and uh, there's a bit of an explosion and a few shots fired the nips went left us in a hurry but uh, I know one bloke got a, a very close shave bullets whizzed being his ear and his forehead unfortunately he was killed later on but uh, it was a terrific valley because it was about 20 miles wide and there's a mountain about 15,000 feet up and snow on top, you know, it's incredible. And it was glorious country if you only had time to. <laughs> I got dengue and uh, I went to the hospital for a fortnight and it was a bit weaker after that. Well, there was action on Palace Hill when there was a, uh, 11 men enlisted in one section and that has a VC, a DCM, four MMs, and the most mentioned in the stats is the most highly decorated section in either war. Well, the two basically got the DCM on Palace Hill, which we were supporting fire. The black was firing the blend right, and right alongside me and said, I, I can't see the case. I said, well, give me the gun and I'll show you. I can see him. Fired two bursts, rolled back, and he got one straight through the head. So it was finish for him he was mortally wounded he died next morning we were supporting the turn and we were all there firing up about 700 yards because it kept the nip's head down and the blokes managed to get around how they got around I don't know but they did and climbed up and attacked them and with the bayonet got rid of them and some of the nips uh, jumped over the side and all sorts of things to avoid it. It was a terrible war because, well, nobody took any prisoners because, for instance, the Japanese had the impression or a, a fixation that even if they were killed, as long as they could kill someone else with them, so if they were even badly wounded, they hired a grenade and then fired as soon as the boat came and you have to kill or be killed. That was the way it was. 
eventually came home. Well, I got an accelerated release to come home on the, in January '46, I think it was. Why did you get an accelerated release? Because I was continuing my vet science when I came back, and uh, anyhow, I finished my veterinary degree. Then I came up here because my mother had just died, and Dad came up. My old uncle Hilton Doyle next door said, uh, "Well, you better do something better useful to come along and work with me." So I did, and I didn't practice my veterinary science, which is a pity in a way. Father was a rear admiral in the in navy, you see. But your dad was serving in World War Two as well. Yeah, well, it's only thirty years, you know. So many both. Dad was born in 1888 and he died in 1984. He was 96 when he went. Alec Dorton Doyle, he was third naval member. He went to England just before the war, inspected and brought out a flotilla of destroyers. How disappointed were you or how disappointed was he when, the, when you discovered you were colour blind? Oh, he knew it was before I did. I mean, he was suspected that. Oh, it didn't worry me unduly, I just, I got annoyed, <laughs> because I couldn't get in the Air Force, but uh, I had joined the Navy, out uh, of the Army, and I had three years with the battalion, so uh, pretty good. So I was a company runner, really an efficient one, but I was a company runner, so a so. company runner went straight up to the town and then back, it was his job, it was a pretty scary job if uh, it not, never worried me because it never seemed to be used in action. You didn't have to do much running in action? No, I didn't. I a kind of company orderly corporal, that's why I was keeping all the records and things for the company. Must have been a hell of a mess. <laughs> I have four children, three of them are married. How many grandchildren? Three, four, five grandchildren. The eldest was seven. Oh, so you're not going to get any great-grandchildren? Well, I don't think so. I'll have to do <laughs> quite a long time. <laughs> when did you get married? In 1952. 52, yeah. Mm. And my wife died. And what was your wife's name? Mabel Constance Doyle. Mabel. Mabel Constance. So do you think the war had much of an impact on your life? Uh only for the friends I've made. I don't think it has, because my life was pretty happy anyway, so... I was a soldier, and I was a private or a corporal, and I did what I was told. And that's what you would do. It was, I say, thank heavens, every time I think of that Kokoda track in Bayuna and Gona, thank God I didn't need it.